So good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today for a conversation about the upcoming U.S. presidential election and what it means for the rest of the world. I'm Evan Lieberman. I direct the Center for International Studies, and I'm a professor of political science here at MIT. So today's STAR Forum features experts who will discuss the upcoming American election from the perspective of citizens, elites, and the media in Africa, Asia, Europe, and Latin America. Um, so we've, we've asked all of them to consider a few questions. They'll, they'll answer as many of them as they uh, decided to, including what's at stake for these countries and regions? Is America still seen as a model for democracy around the world? How do these regions view our candidates? And what will the impact of the election be on their regions? So while Americans are very much focused on how this election will affect us, we wanted to widen the aperture beyond our nation's borders and try and capture a sense of how the world is seeing our country. America, of course, remains a critically important actor in the global arena, economically, politically, militarily, and culturally. And I hope that today's presentation's discussion will provide some insights and provoke some productive dialogue. And I, I know that none of our, when we talk about big world regions and we've given them only 12 minutes each, they're not gonna capture the full views of the entire region. Some of them may choose to focus on, on just one country, but I'm really curious to hear what they have to say and I've been looking forward to this event for a while. Um, so as is our custom, we're first gonna hear from the speakers and then the speakers and I are gonna join each other um, up on stage for some conversation. And then we're gonna conclude with a Q&A um, for those of you who are here today. And so for the Q&A portion, um, please be mindful that we wanna get in as many questions as possible. So please have just one question ready, and, and I ask you for a question. Um, sometimes people, there's that fine line between question and comment, but we're asking for a question. Um, and, and when it comes time, I'll just ask you to line up behind those microphones in the aisle, and if you choose to do so, um, to introduce yourself and your affiliation. Um, for those of you who might be celebrating the Jewish New Year, which begins at sunset, I wish you a Shana Tova, and we certainly understand if you need to duck out early. All right, without further ado, let me introduce our terrific uh, speakers. I'm gonna give a very brief bio. They're all very impressive individuals, um, and I encourage you to check out their, their websites. Um, first, Katrina Burgess is an expert on Latin America, and she's professor of political economy um, and director of the Henry Lear Institute of Migration and Human Security at the Fletcher School uh, uh, at Tufts, and she's gonna speak first. Daniel Ziblatt, focusing on Europe, is the director of Harvard's uh, Minda de Gunsberg Center for European Studies, and he is the Eden Professor of Government, and he's gonna speak second. John Gatango, who will speak on Africa, currently resides at the Center for International Studies. He's our prestigious Robert E. Wilhelm Fellow, um, and has had a career as a journalist and as a leading anti-corruption advocate. And Prerna Singh, our final speaker discussing Asia, is the Mahatma Gandhi Professor of Political Science and International Studies at Brown. So our speakers are each gonna have 12 minutes from the podium, um, and, and after that, um, we'll, we'll return to their seats, and then again, we'll, we'll all uh, join one another up here on stage. So please join me in welcoming Katrina Burgess to the podium. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks everyone for coming on this beautiful fall day. Um, so I'm going to talk about Latin America, the view from Latin America, and I'm going to start out a bit unconventionally with an audio clip. So let me tell you what happened, and then I'll explain why I've started with this particular audio clip. So the song that you just heard a little snippet of is originally a classic song by a Mexican band called Mana, and they did a remix uh, with a reggaeton or artist who's Puerto Rican Dominican named Nicky Jam. Mana is from Guadalajara, which is a major city in Mexico, but has a decades-long record of strong support for, for migrants and, and pro-immigration policy. Nikki Jam was born in Lawrence, Massachusetts, not too far from here, moved to Puerto Rico as a kid, and then relocated to Colombia. Well, last month, 
As this photo shows, Nikki Jam appeared at a Trump rally in Las Vegas and expressed his strong support for Trump and his campaign. In response, Mana wrote on Instagram that it does not work with racists and would pull the song from online platforms. So the reasons I found this story relevant to what I'm going to present today are threefold, at least. One, the US election is also polarizing in Latin America. Two, the Latin American diaspora plays an increasingly important role in US electoral politics. And three, this controversy, I think, is emblematic of the increasingly fluid identities and politics in the Americas. So with that, I'm going to turn initially to some very broad data on um, public opinion vis-a-vis -vis the two rival platforms and candidates. And I'm going to start with the view from the diaspora. Um, because again, I think it's, you really can't disconnect the two, certainly in this day and age. So first of all, in terms of candidate preference, you can see from the chart on the, the, your left that people of Latin American descent are more favorable toward Harris, less favorable toward Trump than the, the US, the otherwise US electorate, but the margin is, 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 is narrowing, right? There's a sizable chunk of support for Trump particularly among Cubans, um, but also increasingly among Mexicans, Puerto Ricans, um, and, and other members of the Latin American diaspora. And I think the other categories is, is especially notable because we're seeing a significant increase in non-Mexican immigrants in the United States. So I think in the future, this may be a sign of a, of, a, of a trend, and it's really pretty even for those who are from other countries in Latin America. The other thing that I, that, that I wanted to kind of illustrate with this slide is, is how they stand on a particularly salient issue in the election, but interestingly, it's not the most salient issue for the, those polled for the, for the, that produce this, the, this, these results. The top issues, like for most people, were the, the economy, cost of living, and only 24% of those polled cited immigration as one of the top three issues. However, when, at, when they commented on immigration, there was a clear split, very high levels of trust in Harris for preserving and expanding legal pathways for Latin American immigrants, and much less trust on the issue of border security. In fact, they trust Trump more than Harris. Again, kind of consistent with the broader electorate. So now let's go south of the border and take a, a, a brief look at some public opinion findings um, with regard to at least a few countries in Latin America. And this is from a larger study done by the Pew Research Center of 34 countries. I'm highlighting the six countries that they included from Latin America. Um, and as you can see here on the left-hand graph, the, the, the question is, um, do you have trust in this, in the US, in, in this person to do the right thing regarding world events? And the, you know, Biden, this was before the, he stepped down as the candidate, Biden doesn't do all that well, right? He does better than Trump um, in these Latin American countries, but also in general across the 34 countries. It's pretty split um, as to whether people trust Biden and perhaps by extension Harris to do the right thing in world affairs. Trump does terribly. Right? And I'm sure we're going to be hearing this again um, when people talk about some of the other regions. And really, a, a, something that jumps out for me here is Mexico. 12% right? of Mexicans, according to this poll, trust that Trump would do the right thing um, in, in, in world affairs. And I'll talk a little bit more about why that might be the case. Um, so at the same time, the Latin American views are not that far from the median. Right? There's, there are some differences when you look at the other regions, but generally they're not really that far apart from other parts of the world. The second public opinion result I'm going to share um, is what they think about US democracy. And I found this really fascinating. And so the three categories are the green is that it's a good example for other countries to follow. The tan is that it used to be a good example, but not anymore. And the blue is that it was never a good example. And you can see that a plurality of respondents think the US is no longer a good example of democracy for the rest of the world to follow. This is quite disturbing. Um, and, and Mexico, once again, the, has the, the, the smallest share that think that you, the US is a, is a good model of democracy to follow, but, it, but it's, it cuts across these different countries. And again, pretty consistent with the median, right? Across 34 countries from, from, from several different re regions. 
So this suggests that something has been going on that is making people in Latin America, if not the world, um, not too confident um, in either candidate, but, but also in US democracy. So now I want to turn for the last part of my talk to some of the policies and the policy implications of the different platforms for the countries of Latin America. And I will attempt to do this in the very short amount of time I have. So first, a broadly kind of quick historical context. Latin America is a key economic and security partner of the United States. It always has been. There are neighbors. Um, we've been intertwined for centuries. And yet, it doesn't get much attention. And um, one scholar years ago coined this as benign neglect. So it's a benign neglect punctuated by security threats. So in the Cold War, it was communism and the Soviet Union. In the 1990s, it was the drug, drug trade. And since 9-11, uh, it's really been migration and the border. This is the security threat that we need to pay lots of attention to. Otherwise, Latin America doesn't show up in the news or really in policy conversations. So is this still true? Is this true in the 2024 campaigns? Yes. Latin America does not appear in the platforms of either candidate, except when they're talking about immigration or the US-Mexico border, which has become a very salient issue for all voters in the United States, I think even more so in this election than, than maybe ever in history. And I'll just note that Mexico just recently became our top trading partner, right? Brazil is, our, is the ninth largest exporter to the United States. It doesn't match on the ways in which Latin America is significant, but this is how US policy has tended to, to, to sort of consider Latin America and, and be formulated toward Latin America. So let me go through three buckets of policy very quickly. I'm not going to read everything on the slide. You can read it while I'm speaking. So for Harris on trade investment and, and climate, the Harris administration, I think, will probably be quite consistent. With the Biden administration, you're likely to see a further expansion in all three things, including continued and maybe increased support for the green energy transition in Latin America, which has a number of oil producing countries, a lot of potential for green energy that will be supported. Um, I think. Not just about economics, though. It's partly about migration, addressing root causes, and partly about competing with China. Mostly positive for Latin American economies, at least on the, on the sort of in the aggregate level, but may be likely to intensify um, conflict in mining regions, particularly indigenous communities in the Andes, because we need minerals to fuel the green energy transition. Trump, total opposite. Um, if he actually carries out some of the policies threatening, for example, the across the board 10 to 20% tariff on all imports. Um, this could be devastating for Latin America, very dependent on, on, on exports to the United States. Um, he's most likely would try to use the renegotiation, uh, renegotiation of, the, of the North American Free Trade Agreement, which is now the USMCA, as leverage to get Mexico to crack down even more on immigrants. He did that in his previous administration. Some worry that free trade agreements could fall apart. And if they do, then this tariff would really more widely affect um, uh, Latin America. And then I think he would, his policies would, would sort of empower pro-fossil fuel factions within Latin American governments, right? So in terms of tipping the balance of who has the, the, the upper hand, um, it, it could affect that. Another bucket of, of issues is democracy and human rights. So for Harris, it'll be part of their foreign policy agenda. I think they'll be quite willing to use at least soft power and carrots to resist democratic backsliding and human rights abuses, both of which are quite rampant in the region. Um, but if push comes to shove, I think migration control will take priority, particularly over, over human rights defense. Trump, again, kind of the opposite. No real commitment to either of these things. It's kind of a rail politique, but, in, but, but guided by domestic agendas and domestic politics. So it, everything, I think, will be aligned with the object, objectives of stopping migration and sustaining his anti-communist credentials, which is part of the why he's so popular among key diaspora constituencies in the United States, those who come from left-wing autocrats who are sort of painted with the broad brush of, of being communist. And so I think there'd be preference of sticks over carrots, no, really no guardrails on would-be autocrats, particularly from the right. And I'll close with my minute and a half left with my favorite topic, which I'd be happy to talk more about in the Q&A, which is borders on migration. So just to note, the migratory landscape in Latin America has changed dramatically in the last 10 years. The US response has been largely reactive and ineffective. In that context, Harris has moved increasingly, Biden and Harris, toward being tough 
on borders and asylum for all sorts of political reasons. I think that will continue, um, but much more supportive of legal pathways. However, so they're severely limited by con congressional inaction. So there's only so much they can do in that direction. Trump, much harsher measures um, all around. And I think this could have, if he carries out some of his promises, like mass deportation, which I don't think he can actually do, but he, might, he may well try, this could have seriously negative effects in terms of social dislocation, in terms of uh, reduced remittances, which are essential to uh, particularly communities, but also countries' bottom line. Um, and I think you know, the highly toxic rhetoric that we've been hearing will just per 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 persist. And I suspect that's a big part of the reason why Trump has such a negative reputation in Latin America is because the way he talks about Latin people from Latin America, Latin American countries, et cetera. So I will close there. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, I have some slides as well. Great. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about uh, European perceptions, and I'm drawing on a little bit of the same data, the Pew data that we just heard about. I, I'm going to make three broad. Um, so, how do I move the slides? Oh, this, right? Is that what this is here? Okay, sorry. Three, three broad things. I, I first just want to give a little context to the European American relationship transatlantic relationship, as it's often called, uh, and then dig in a little bit into some of the data that, um, that I've come across as well. So the first thing I guess I wanted to say is, you know, what unites the transatlantic world? Um, you know, at a very general level, you know, there, there was this uh, political scientist at MIT for many years, Carl Deutsch, who used this phrase, the North Atlantic community. And I think that actually describes something that's still very real, the sense through World War II, the Cold War, the post-Cold War world, that there is a community, a kind of self-conscious collective identity, um, that this is a part of the world that is committed to democracy, free markets, human rights. So that, that's still pretty robust. Um, what that also means, though, is that in the, there's a set of parallel and shared challenges to that self-conception in Europe and uh, in the United States. And those are really centered around the emergence of uh, radical right demagogic political parties. And so the emergence of anti-immigrant radical right parties that are often anti-democratic um, is around 30%. Usually these kinds of parties gain around 30% of the electorate. If you look at the recent elections in East Germany, around 30% of the votes went to the uh, radical right AFD uh, in France, uh, in the Netherlands. Um, this, is, this is a kind of constant almost, a sociological constant. And if you look at the core of the MAGA base in the United States, that's also around 30% of the American electorate. And so this is a commonality, and this represents a, share, a, a kind of a parallel challenge in, in all of these societies. Um, lying behind that are also a shared set of, of challenges that are in part driving, I think, this, this process. And what, what I think of as really driving these, both in, in North America and in Western Europe in particular, are this kind of triple cocktail of forces, um, uh, economic declines in economic growth, um, increased uh, ethnic diversity due to immigration, technological changes of uh, change media landscape, all of these things provide you know, inc incredibly powerful raw materials for demagogues. And so in many ways, I think the challenges facing our democracies are very similar. So, th so that's the kind of broad context uniting the transatlantic world. What divides the transatlantic world, I think, comes out of the, the, both the COVID experience and uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And in particular, I think what those two events did is exposed the, the globe, not only the global weight of the, of the United States, but a kind of asymmetric in, uh, dependence of Europe on the United States. And in particular, I would say that the kind of arrival of COVID meant, and I have three I have pictures here, I think, the arrival of COVID exposed three vulnerabilities, and each of these pictures represent one of those vulnerabilities. The first being uh, the kind of breakdown of supply chains exposed the degree to which Europe had outsourced its manufacturing even more so than the United States outside of Europe. Uh, and this re represented a, a vulnerability to Europe. Uh, a second uh, vulnerability um, exposed during the Russian invasion of Ukraine is the degree to which Europe had outsourced its energy production outside of Europe, in, in particular its reliance on, on Russian oil. In 2022, 60% of European Union's uh, energy sources were from outside of Europe, and increasingly also now on the United States. Um, and so that's a second kind of outsourcing that exposed a vulnerability. And then the third outsourcing exposed also by COVID 
uh, is, or rather by the Russian invasion of Ukraine, is the outsourcing of, of national security to the United States in particular. Um, and of course, NATO is important, but the U.S.'s outsized role, role in all of this meant that there kind of was an exposure to uh, a kind of realization to a degree that hadn't been there before that Europe was increasingly dependent on, on and both secure in terms of security, in terms of economics, um, in terms of energy on actors outside of their own borders. And in particular, the U.S. as a geopolitical heavyweight, uh, you know, there, there's this sort of sense of vulnerability. And also what this means, I think, is that increasingly there's a sense that Europe is vulnerable to what happens in the United States. Um, and so another way to put this is that, you know, when, a, when democracy gets into trouble in a small country, it's often very tragic for the people living in the small country. But when democracy gets into trouble in a very big country, this has global, global reverberations. And I think Europeans are acutely aware of this. There's one other thing that has added a kind of particular nervousness, I would say, to European leaders, um, and that is the uneven uh, economic developments in Europe versus the United States since COVID, so the sort of post-COVID economic recovery. And what's very clear is that both in terms, of in, in terms of inflation, in terms of unemployment, in terms of annual GDP growth rates, the U.S. has, has thrived in the Biden era in comparison to Europe. And, and European state leaders, European CEOs are acutely aware of this and very jealously and sort of frustratingly look to what's happening in the United States. And, there, and the kind of common understanding of this is that Biden, by having spent so much money in you know, federal spending and the infrastructure bill and so on, this kind of willingness to run up debts that European governments either are not capable of doing or not willing to do, have hamstrung European economies. And so European, again, the CEOs and, and business leaders and, and political leaders look to what's happening and sort of this adds this uh, an increased sense of vulnerability. Um, so you add all of this together, and again, Europeans, I think, are increasingly worried about what's happening in the United States. So, so what are Europeans thinking about? So on the one hand, you know, as I said, there's a kind of jealous look at the American economy. The American economy is thriving, and there's this paradox that at exactly the moment the American economy is thriving, there's a real sense that American politics is unraveling, and this is what makes people so nervous. So I pulled together some, some of the same data, um, uh, but some other sources. And this is just using UK to begin with. I mean, there's kind of majorities in favor of Harris. This is, I think, taken pretty recently, August 2024, um, who are, think that the best outcome, this is not unique at all. The Great Britain is not unique at all. If you look at Germany, you even get more striking, overwhelming support, Germans for Harris over, um, over Trump. Um, you might wonder, well, who is, who is it in that little red category there that's supporting Trump in Germany? Um, and so if you kind of dig into it a little bit and just look by party, what you see, the Green Party supporters, SPD socialists, the FDP is the Liberal Party, CDU. The BSW is a, a new party on the far left. But the most prominent support comes from the AFD, which is the radical right party. So this is pretty interesting because I think very much mirroring what we just heard, there's a way in which polarization domestically is being reflected internationally, and that people on the radical right in Germany and elsewhere in Western Europe, as we'll see here, see Trump as, as an ally. And these are the only ones in Germany who really uh, like uh, uh, the Trump movement. Um, we see something very similar. Um, and I should just say one other thing about this. The AFD mimics Trump's rhetorical techniques, you know, tries to break taboos, break norms, and so on. So it's very much kind of follows in, in Trump's mold. Uh, we see very similar uh, things in Poland. Uh, there's large pluralities favoring Harris. Uh, one exception, at least in this particular poll, is young people, as you see here. Um, and this is, you know, you know, this may just be this particular poll, but I think there's something more general going on here in recent elections in Western Europe and Germany, just in the regional elections in the last couple of, in the last month, one of the things that's very striking is that the radical right does best among people in their early 20s. And so I think this is a phenomenon that political scientists really, to my mind, haven't really sufficiently explained systematically. I mean, we can think of all sorts of reasons why might th this might be the case, but this finding seems to kind of accord uh, with that. The one big exception to all of this is uh, Hungary, the one country where uh, an authoritarian populace has been in power uh, since 2010. And so maybe it's not so surprising. Overall, you see here that people who are satisfied with Orban, so the incumbent prime minister who's a, an ally of, of Trump's, are overwhelmingly supportive of Trump, uh, and the op anti orban opposition uh, is against um, uh, Trump. And again, you see this kind of mirroring of polarization um, where the kind of 
national polarization gets reflected in these assessments of inter international dynamics. And in some ways, this is then what this suggests is that you know, Trump knows what he's doing when he invites Viktor Orban to Mar-a-Lago. And you know, Orban gets invited to the you know, conservative, uh, I forget what the organization is, where the conservatives come together in the United States and he's kind of treated as a, mo as a model. So each side regards each other uh, as a model. Final um, thing I wanted to deal with was, uh, well, actually, here, this is just some more data. This, this, I'm sorry. This is more data. Basically, we see um, there's sort of generally lack of confidence. This reinforces the general trend that we were just talking about. This is also now from the same Pew data. So this is nice that we can compare this the, the, um, on sort of this sense of what, what do you think about American democracy? Um, so. You know, I, one way of looking at this is only in Poland is American democracy perceived as being a really good example, uh, perceived as particularly po perceived particularly poorly in Germany. Um, and again, I would echo the same point. That's the this, this sort of question that, you know, maybe a, a, a function a bit of the question, uh, uh, but it's interesting to see that, you know, that that many Europeans think the U.S. used to be a good example. And so all of this reflects, I think this core reality, and I think the fact that we're seeing this both from Latin America as well as from Europe, is that there is a way in which, um, you know, America has experienced democratic backslide. I mean, this is, not an this is not in people's imagination. The U.S. has gone from a Freedom House score in 2016 of 94 to 83, which puts the U.S. on par with Romania and two points behind, behind Argentina. And so people are actually uh, looking at something and seeing something that's happening that's real. And so, um, what all of this leaves us, and I have just two minutes left, I, I kind of want to make the point that this increasingly leaves, leaves Europeans really in a bind uh, because tr Trump has threatened to leave NATO or there's kind of, you know, the idea that he might leave NATO, that he has strong allegiances to Putin. I don't know if you saw the press conference with Zelensky the other day when he was asked, you know, you know what he said something. I have, you know, very good friendship with um, with Putin and Zelensky standing right next to him said, well, I hope you have a stronger relationship with me. And he said, uh, ha, 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 I didn't really confirm that. But what this means, though, is that if Trump comes to office, this leaves Europeans in a bind with the war unfolding 500 miles from Berlin. I mean, this is the distance from San Francisco to San Diego. With war unfolding 500 miles from Berlin and the sense that Trump might be a kind of ally of, of Putin's you know, are European uh, officials going to be willing to share intelligence with Trump? I mean, this really is a, is a, is a real question. Um, and just this, this immediate question also raises the broader issue, I would say, that even if Trump loses, there's this sense that America is only one election away from this kind of event happening once again. And so there's a degree to which Europeans, I think, increasingly ask, you know, maybe we need to hedge our risks here and start looking for allies elsewhere. Um, and I think, you know, personally, I'm the director of the Center for European Studies, but I think more generally as an American, this is certainly a major risk for the United States uh, when we're not regarded as an ally because this undercuts our kind of core interests and uh, kind of this, the sense that we have this shared uh, community. So I think I'll end there. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, my name is John Gedongo. I'm not a, I'm not an academic, so I'll, I'll, um, my background is in media and anti-corruption work, and so I'll I'll endeavour to give um, some context of African relations with the U.S., where we are now, and what's happening within the continent that is uh, defining that that relationship. In, in June this year, um, I happened to be on the streets in Kenya when we had some massive protests in about 40 out of 47 counties or you know, many states within, uh, within the country, led by youth, Generation Z um, youth. And uh, the demonstrations were, were so massive and so widespread and so organic that uh, the government was, the president was forced to sack, basically to dismiss his entire cabinet of ministers to reappoint new ones and to make a whole host of other changes. The primary complaints of the young people in Kenya um, were the same as what we are seeing and witnessing in other parts of Africa, especially in, in the Sahel, where we've had a number of coups that generally have the support of, of young people. Young people are ambivalent or um, even supportive of the changes. It's, it's about bad governance, 
about corruption, about elections that are increasingly unsuccessful. The democracy isn't delivering. And the opinion polls that the, the research that I, I refer to is by Afrobarometer, which is available online. Um, and the Ichkovitz Foundation out of South Africa who poll um, African youth attitudes. And I'm also aware of, of the work that uh, Pew have done. Um, and as attitudes have shifted in Africa over the last just 18 years, African youth increasingly believe that democracy is the best system for governing uh, the continent, but inc democracy increasingly does not deliver. And that has led to a change um, in, in attitudes to the point that I would say that the you know, US is increasingly in, in trouble uh, on the African continent. We've seen a number of countries like Chad and Niger where US troops have been expelled uh, from the continent or relations have broken down the, to the extent that the troops have to leave. Out of countries where uh, we have large ungoverned territories where terrorism is a, is, is a big problem. Um, I started with this sort of reflection on my experience on the streets uh, in Kenya because by 2100, 30% of uh, the world's population will be African. 50% of the world's young people uh, will, be, will be African. And uh, their perceptions of the U United States have changed fairly dramatically over the last 15 to 20 years. And now, the country with, which enjoys the most positive perceptions in terms of, and has a model of development that people are looking uh, to, uh, surprisingly, is China. Um, the U.S. is still um, leading uh, in the polls. Uh, one looks at Afrobarometer and the Ichkovich Foundation. But uh, those perceptions are changing and changing fairly rapidly uh, on the continent, which is interesting, especially considering that uh, the U.S. across Africa and its model of governance has been, uh, I think you call it here, the shining house on the hill uh, in terms of a model that is open, uh, that is free, and um, that, that, that people would want to uh, emulate. Um, this, this change has consequences in terms of it's, it's, it's almost as if uh, the U.S. has woken up and realized that this change has happened, and the Biden administration in particular, coming after the Trump administration, who had very clear views about Africa, um, has attempted to, to correct this, while also um, competing uh, so urgently uh, with China. They're doing this in the context of this massive youth bulge on the continent. And these are the healthiest, most educated, most globally connected in terms of just information technology um, generation in African history. And they have also expressed, they're also expressing the most uh, sharpest moral clarity we've had since uh, the struggle for independence across Africa in the 40s, 50s, and uh, 60s. They're very clear about international affairs and uh, what they consider to be right and, and to, be, to be wrong. Um, well, the U.S. has traditionally always had the best infrastructure for, for elite influence uh, in Africa, whether it's uh, the State Department, uh, it's myriad of programs to the media, Hollywood. Uh, the U.S. has traditionally had uh, the best infrastructure for exerting soft power, and this has had a tremendous impact. When one looks at the statistics, though, just simple statistics like the number of students going to, to university uh, in the US, from Africa, and going to China. Uh, 2018, um, um, 81,000 students uh, from Sub-Saharan Africa in Chinese universities. Um, last year, uh, African students coming into the US, 57,000. And those figures, between 2015 and just 2018, the figures of students going into China rose by about 60%. So it's, you know, this tremendous, quiet, uh, very effective uh, investment. And, and this is um, having a profound impact uh, in, in the way uh, Africans perceive uh, the US and, and uh, global affairs. Um, I'm not going to pretend that uh, Africans think very much about US elections, but US is the US, and everyone has an opinion on what's happening here. And they're followed uh, in the sense that we know who the competitors are, 
I would say the European stati uh, um, statistics in terms of who supports what uh, would be mirrored uh, a little bit uh, for much of Africa. As I said, Mr. Trump has got his uh, attitude towards Africa and the quote-unquote shithole countries, and that uh, affects attitudes on the continent. However, there is a small and strong committed group that supports uh, Mr. Trump, uh, and that is especially amongst the evangelicals uh, who um, find a considerable track uh, with him. Um, in terms of some of the issues that have had a lot of resonance on the African continent, so that, uh, my background is, is in media. Interestingly, recently it was Mr. Biden stepping down as president of the United States. That was very surprising. You know, in some countries, people say that's completely outrageous. Why? Why would somebody, uh, you know, with with no gun to his head, um, <laughs> accept to to step down because he's got telephone calls uh, and that kind of thing? So these are the kind of things that impact. Uh, I mean, this is really American democracy at its best. And for me, coming into into the U.S., watching the presidential debate uh, between uh, candidate Harris and and Mr. Trump. Uh, it's one of the reflections that I've had repeatedly, and one hears amongst policymakers on the African continent as things change and people, Africa feels, okay, we're not that important to the U.S. at a time when Africa is young and precocious, uh, ambitious, well-educated, healthy. Uh, people say, okay, if the U.S. isn't that interested in relations with us, we're going to um, look elsewhere. And uh, it's clear that Sometimes the U.S. doesn't actually have an idea of how important democracy in the U.S. is to democracy around the world. That actually democracy is precarious. You know, we all talk of uh, democratic backsliding. It's around the world. And this is the year of democracy, four billion people going to the polls. And you know, it's gone well in countries like South Africa. It's gone well in India, better than people had anticipated. And of course, we are waiting to see what happens here. Because what happens here, uh, sets a tone uh, for democratic expression around the world. Sometimes we feel the U.S. doesn't really appreciate that if it goes wrong here, um, candidates refuse to accept the results, uh, people storm Congress, that kind of thing, which some of us are more used to than others, that has a huge impact <laughs> on uh, lots of uh, leaders who are a lot less democratically inclined, saying, well, you know, uh, this is more of a rationale for us to, uh, to hold on to quite uh, autocratic uh, ways. Um, the, we are going through, in, in terms of the defining issues, and, uh, and I'm talking to, to policymakers. I was uh, in, Washington, in New York last week, just talking to some of my, my colleagues um, there. Um, one of the defining issues for for the African continent in the coming um, 36 months is debt. Africa has got about $1.1 trillion of debt. 30% um, 30 of, 30 of that is multilateral, World Bank, IMF, etc. But 43, 44, about 43% is owed to private uh, players and bondholders, and about 23% um, to bilaterals. Um, Three quarters of Africans um, pay more in interest payments than, in, um, than to health and education. And every single state house, every single government office one visits where people are invo involved in managing financial affairs, this is the discussion. How, what is the US's posture around the way this debt is going to be managed uh, and, and, and the environment? And um, there are a few countries that uh, are ahead on that. Um, in terms of uh, the elections are, are coming this year, the, the one interesting aspect of, of the U.S. policy making that has captured the imagination across the continent has been hearings in, in, on Capitol Hill by AFRICOM, the, the security um, uh, arm of U.S. Gov uh, army engagement in, the, in Africa. And these have expressed a policy that seems to be taking Africa back into a Cold War posture. So between candidate Trump and candidate Harris, 
this is, these are the choices that people are, are studying that are going to be made. Is it, are we going back to pre-1990 uh, on the African continent where there's this huge competition between the US and China and now other actors, the Turkeys and the others, and uh, this is what we are watching on the continent. But as I said, the relationship overall, the US is in trouble uh, in Africa. Thank you. So uh, thank you all for being here. And I will be talking today about India, which is the world's largest democracy. And I just wanted to begin by talking a little about some of the shared ground and connections that India and the US share today and historically. So at 1.5 billion and a, a democracy since 1947 with a short interregnum of about two years, India is very proud to be and, and is proud to lay claim to be the largest democracy and of course the US uh, is the second largest. They are both federal countries. Professor Ziblatt has written a classic book about the conditions under which countries become federal. India is much more centralized in its federalism than the US is. And they have a shared legacy of British colonialism. The US revolution against Britain was, a, was an important background for India's nationalist struggle uh, centuries later. They're also highly ethnically diverse. Um, and what I want to point to in particular is India's linguistic diversity, because this will come into play in a second. Um, and in particular, to just uh, draw your attention to the fact that in addition to having different languages, India is a linguistic federation. So the regional lines, the provincial lines of India are drawn on the basis of different languages. And I want to draw your attention there to Tamil, which is there in the kind of um, southeast of India, which is, um, has always been a very, very proud uh, state, a linguistically proud, sub, what I would call subnationalist state. It is also in terms of ethnic diversity, both countries have what we would call ranked ethnic systems, and Isabel Wilkerson's book, Caste, really brought this out. So race in America and caste in India are often considered parallel, analogous, uh, comparable forms of ethnic hierarchies, and also many connections. Um, Evan spoke about the Jewish holidays. As we come upon another one, it's important to keep in mind that, of course, Columbus came to the US uh, looking for India. And, uh, and, but, you know, and I could keep talking about many of these uh, shared connections, but also to point out that there is, uh, going back to the legacy of British colonialism and resistance to it, also many connections. The one that I always love to talk about, especially because we are in New England today, is between Gandhi, who was, of course, uh, the leader of India's nonviolent nationalist movement, uh, was inspired by Thoreau, who wrote here in uh, near Walden, and uh, who it, Gandhi, in turn, of course, inspired Martin Luther King, going back to the analogy between race and caste who made a, he said, I'm not making a visit uh, to India. He said, all other countries I visit, India I go as a pilgrim, a devotee. And, uh, and while he was in India, he was introduced as the head of the untouchable castes in America. And uh, you know, he writes in his, in his writings how he was initially really stunned and actually quite upset at this introduction until he realized a connection that, of course, Du Bois and others have made, which is that the untouchables in India and blacks in America do come from a very similar uh, socioeconomic cultural um, context. And so that was a kind of appellation that he then um, actually accepted and, uh, and reveled in and made again and again. So um, coming to the present period, again, uh, we've spoken about the democratic decline and erosion. And the thing to keep in mind, of course, is that uh, India and the US have visited, in some ways, uh, parallel declines in democracy. By many, uh, by many indicators of democracy, India is actually no longer quite a democracy. Um, and it has happened uh, at the hands of parties and leaders that have espoused a very resonant forms of exclusionary nationalism that come couched in this uh, working class, uh, populist, underdog rhetoric. 
So the one way in which India and the U.S. part, and I think that becomes important as we get into the coverage of the U.S. elections in India, is the real decline of the freedom of press and expression more generally in India that I don't think has had quite the same um, analog in the U.S. Um, or ana like it hasn't been analogous here in the U.S. And so there have been killings of journalists in, in daylight, um, you know, this is a newspaper headline that talks about India being one of the most dangerous countries for journalists, but also uh, imprisonment of journalists. And so this, the public sphere that you're seeing in India is a highly constricted one. And so when we are talking about the coverage of really anything, uh, we have to kind of keep in mind that the mainstream media, newspapers, television channels, um, are in many ways um, almost propaganda machines uh, and not the kind of raucous, free space uh, press uh, that they were even a decade ago. Um, so, so that's just the context. So the coverage of U.S. elections in India, you know, um, I always think Indians have a particular way of putting things. And so, of course, that meme blew up when Kamala Harris said, you know, you didn't just fall out of a coconut tree. And uh, I always think that a good analogy to that is that um, a new... A journalist was talking about, in general, why it is that the U.S. elections are not so covered in the Indian media. And he said, well, we have bigger fish to fry. So that's your, your kind of coastal metaphor. And the bigger fish to fry, of course, is that India can be a quite inward looking and South Asia more broadly. So India has elections of its own coming up in three major states. And so that has been a preoccupation for the Indian media. Also the domestic market is pretty big in India. And so it is very much focused on domestic issues. But, and this links to John's point, the one thing that has received a lot of coverage are presidential debates. And the underlying context to this is this question that Indian commentators ask themselves, can our leaders dare to debate like this? And so the Indian presidential debates were covered in their entirety. Um, many, many people that I uh, know watched them with an interest uh, that I can't say I, I necessarily saw among my friends in the US. And the context for this, again, is that in India's present prime minister has not given a press conference um, for quite a long time now. And so there is this context in which our prime minister does not meet the press. Um, and you know, no, no press conference, no problem, that when the presidential debates are aired, people, again, talking about how the US makes them reflect on their own politics, say, well, you know, our, our leaders don't even meet the press. And here these leaders are out there really debating, going after each other. And so what does that mean? Um, the interesting thing is, of course, Prime Minister Modi said he doesn't hold press conferences because he's going to debate in parliament. Um, and then, of course, when parliament came around, this is the leader of the opposition, uh, Rahul Gandhi from the Congress party. And of course, uh, he didn't debate there either. So the presidential debates, the lack thereof, what does it mean for a democracy to hold these debates? What does it mean for a democracy not to hold these debates has actually been a really lively and quite uh, thoughtful conversation in India. Beyond that, I think we can divide uh, coverage of US elections in India across two broad um, camps. One is a kind of cultural, emotional coverage. And the second is a coverage about who, which candidate is better for India. The context for this is that if I was to just show you uh, the same Pew data, there is a fair amount of positive coverage of the US. 62% of Indians think uh, the US, think of India in very positive terms. And there is a generally more positive attitude towards the Democrats. Um, Biden actually was quite well supported and now for Kamala Harris as compared to Trump. So the cultural emotional coverage uh, in a large, in large way has uh, really been about the increasing presence of Indian Americans uh, in the presidential fray, but also more broadly. So of course, you know, it's not new. This is Bobby Jindal, uh, who had stood for election. Interestingly, I put here all the, the Republican presidential candidates, because of what I won't be talking about, but is obviously very important, is the Indian diaspora here in the US. And uh, here, kind of, you know, uh, somewhat similar to, to what Katrina spoke about, uh, his 
historically Democrat-leaning group, uh, but Hindus in India, or I think I forget exactly what they're called, have now gone ahead and endorsed Trump um, in the in the in the upcoming presidential context. And so these are all Indian Americans. Well, that's the that's Usha Vance. Uh, so either presidential candidates or wives of presidential uh, candidates. And this has received some emotional cultural coverage uh, in India. Of course, uh, this the, the fact that these are Republican candidates uh, gets to the needle that uh, Indian Americans manage to thread, which is they support the Democrats uh, in the US, but are big supporters of the Hindu nationalist regime in India. And so, so that's, that's another debate uh, that we can have, but all to say that Trump and, uh, and Modi have actually had a very close relationship, uh, and that's, again, uh, been covered in the media. But of course, this gets to the whole point, um, which has, again, received a lot of coverage, which is about Kamala Harris. And so uh, many memes in India, uh, of course, I think the most popular being in Sanskrit is true. Kamala means lotus, the flower. And in Amer America, Kamala means potus. Um, many Indians will tell you this is a meme that actually originated in WhatsApp circles uh, in India. And I certainly got it from my mom uh, well before it became big here. So Kamala Harris has, talking about, has spoken about this walk on the beach in Chennai with her grandfather, how this led her to kind of, you know, have that original democratic impulse, and it led her to call out her chittis. And this, I think, is important. Okay, I'm going to go very quick, because with a word of Tamil, Kamala Harris boosted her fan base in India. So chittis means aunt. It's not a word I'm familiar with, because I'm not a Tamil speaker, but this gets to that map that I showed you, which is in many ways Kamala's um, fan base, the way that she's covered, so regional media in Tamil Nadu has covered Kamala Harris much more than the national media. And this gets to her use of Tamil occasionally. Um, so these are, the, but this, but they covered her much more in her run up to, to the vice presidential election four years ago than here. Because she hasn't really played up her connection to India. This is her ancestral village, um, where there is a TV crew now almost permanently stationed. There are definitely big supporters of her. She has her name in the kind of ancestral temple. There are prayers. Um, you know, there's a little cottage industry of, uh, of kind of Kamala Harris um, explainers in this, uh, in this little village. And Tamil Nadu, um, in a book that I had written, you know, these are a very proud, linguistically proud subnationalist uh, people. And so it I feels very interesting to me in which um, when you look at Donald Trump tweeting, you have all these Tamils who will tweet back uh, with, as you can see, really emotionally intense, um, often at the same emotional mental playing level as him. Um, but you have a lot of these tweets. And so I just want to make the connection between kind of regional importance, regional coverage uh, of the president presidential elections. Okay, so very quickly in, in the last minute, but who is better for India? So even as there is this kind of emo emotional cultural uh, connect, there is a lobby that says actually Kamala Harris would not be India's best bet. Um, she very gently pushed Modi and the LA Times called it pushing him gently. The Indian media called him said he was scolded. Um, and in many ways, there is this uh, sense in India that actually Modi and the present regime would much rather have Trump. So, um, you know, there are all these coverages, a uh, lot of coverage about how actually it would be better for India if Trump won the elections. But what I want to conclude with is that in some ways, the muted and detached coverage beyond Kamala Harris and the emotional cultural connect, uh, beyond the presidential debates, the fact that it hasn't really been as important a topic in the Indian media gets down to the fact that India in some ways doesn't care. And this, oh, it doesn't care so much. And much of this gets to the fact that that now India is the world's fastest growing economy. It is increasingly influential on the global stage. There was a time when the US could dismiss India as a country famously of snake charmers, magicians, and beggars. A Carter visited India and then no US president visited India and really ignored relations with India for almost 25 years till Bill Clinton began the patch up. Um, but those days are gone. India feels that it is unprecedentedly important and for the first time maybe has an upper hand with its relationship relationship uh, with the US, and in many ways, that's because of China. And so India is really playing up its kind of China plus one. Um, who else do you have to turn to but us? It thinks 
um, America has lost a lot of legitimacy in scolding or gently chiding it on its human rights record, given the rise of authoritarian tendencies uh, within India, the fact that the Indian diaspora and all of the capital that comes with it actually supports the present regime. And so this is a very different India, which has really played up its strategic multi-alignment, in which it says it's a friend to all and an enemy to none. And so I want to kind of end um, just with this, because in as much as Trump has embraced Modi, he has essentially embraced everyone. Uh, leaders of the free world uh, to Putin, uh, who he calls a close friend. Uh, India continues to import Russian oil. Uh, he tweets in favor of Netanyahu, even as the Ministry of External Affairs continues to stick to we favor a two-state solution. And so I just want to end by saying the kind of lowered stakes of who wins might help us explain or at least understand the way in which the Indian media has covered the US elections. Thank you. I invite all of you guys to come up. I'm sorry. Great. Well, that was a, a terrific set of presentations. Uh, I really enjoyed um, hearing all of your, your perspectives. And you know, ironically, I think the, the conceit of this event was you know, the US is so important. We're really interested in what all these countries around the world are thinking. <laughs> and what I've heard from several of you is, ah, you know, America's not as important um, to us as, as it, it, it once was in lots of ways, or isn't perceived as, as such. And, and of course, the, the shifting dynamics of power in the world are quite profound. And that's not, not the point that, that all of you made. Um, but you know, one question that's, that's on my mind, especially you know, and it started um, uh, in my head when I heard um, uh, Katrina talking about um, some of the polarization in Latin America, is I, I guess my question for, for whoever wants to take it is, is the polarization that we see coincident with American democracy, or is it somehow caused by it? And you know, clearly in some countries, and maybe most notably in Brazil, right? when we saw Bolsonaro, you couldn't think of him as anything other than, and maybe it's you know very American lens, but he felt like a Brazilian Trump. right? And we see this with other you know, authoritarians in Europe. And so I guess I'm just wondering about you know, the, the, the polarization and views on the American election. It, it, is that somehow caused by people, you know, actors within these various regions for one reason or another, especially taking on a persona of Trump, because he's been a very unique character on the you know, p political playing field, or you know, trying to look like our, you know, the, the, the past Democratic presidents or contenders, whether it's uh, Obama, uh, Biden, or Harris. Any, any takers on that one? Well, I guess since, since you, you, you uh, referred to me and, and to, to Latin America, I wouldn't go that far. I think th that, that this trend is global, and it reflects some global sort of drivers. Um, uh, and, and a couple that, that come to mind in the case of Latin America is, is the Latin America has always been very unequal. I think one of the drivers in the United States is we've become so much more unequal. But the inequality is in the context of democratization. And so I think this sort of disillusionment with democracy, um, what John mentioned, disillusionment with governance, failed governance, uh, that it, it makes these outsiders very appealing. And then they tend to pull from the same playbook and they learn from each other. But I wouldn't, ma I, I wouldn't make a causal argument. Again, the US maybe isn't as important as we think it is, <laughs> that, that there, are, there are these kind of similar dynamics working internally within these countries, but they're responding to similar kinds of phenomena and pressures. Yeah, I, get, I mean, I, I, I refer to these as parallel and shared problems, because I think it's both in the sense that there's parallel developments in these in countries in, in Europe and the United States which are very similar, driving similar outcomes. So increased diversity, slowed economic growth, as I said, the changes in technology and so on. These, are th these things are happening in, in lots of places, not just Europe and the United States. And so in that sense, they're, they're kind of independently being driven by these. But, I, but the, it's a shared challenge in the sense 
But I think they are learning from each other. I mean, I think, I think that Trump, the, the idea of, I mean, sort of when you, you can't unlearn the Trump experience in a way. I mean, people look at this and saw, see that it was successful and then try to begin to emulate it and copy it. And I, I really think that, the, you know, I think mostly about the AFD in Germany is, is really having learned a lot from Trump and Trumpism and the idea that you can, that, that these kind of established ways of doing things, that there's real power in assaulting that and then and saying outrageous things and then stepping back and saying, well, that was misunderstood. I didn't quite mean it that way or, you know, and this kind of game of, of breaking down the ways things have been done and appealing to, and, and the media and the domination of, of social media. Mm -hmm. I mean, what, one of the things that I saw very early on is the AFD, far before any of the other establishment parties was, you know, very early on TikTok and, and Twitter and Facebook and whatever, <laughs> you know, whatever the relevant social media is. And so, um, and this came about sort of at the same time. So I do, I do think that these are shared. Um, there's a kind of, there's a global phenomenon happening and there is learning taking place. John, can I ask you, I, I mean, I was fascinated by uh, the finding, first of all, of youth, um, you know, that you were saying that youth were supporting uh, Trump. And, um, and I'm also curious about um, the role of evangelicals. You know, American evangelicals, you know, highly politicized at the moment in, in America and have been very important in Africa and, and, and we've seen the rise. And, and maybe you could talk a little bit about that and how they see a connection to Trump. Yeah, so I don't get into big trouble. Uh, just want to correct. Yeah. No, the youth are not supporting Trump. Oh, okay, sorry, so that, my mistake, my mistake. <laughs> <laughs> but but um, yeah, uh, amongst, I mean, and here, I mean, the evidence is only when, when uh, from the media and as you uh, interact with your peers and colleagues. Uh, within the evangelical community, uh, there's a strong strain of those who support not just Trump, um, because sometimes he says things that are quite embarrassing, uh, but just the, so the Republican kind of uh, right-wing Republican uh, cause. If one goes into countries where those particular groups have been particularly active, uh, more, within elite politics, South Sudan, for example, in Uganda, where you know laws have been passed uh, criminalizing uh, homosexuality, and a number of other countries, then one will find uh, groups of members of parliament, uh, you know, leaders in, in uh, civil society and, and business, who are quite supportive of uh, of Trump, uh, even though you know it's not something that everyone admits to very easily uh, in, in polite company. And Frana, great to hear your, your views about, about what's going on in India and, um, and again, you know, leaving us with, uh, we've got bigger, you know, we've got other, bigger fish to fry, other things uh, uh, to focus on. Um, but I am curious, again, one, you know, you talked about the relationship with the caste cleavage mm -hmm. um, in, in India. And so, um, and, and there's also, and you also talked about Hindu nationalism. And I wonder if you have any sense, I mean, maybe you don't have data on it, but maybe you have any sense on, on either of those. Is there, for instance, caste differences in India on views of, of our candidates? And then relatedly, where you have this Muslim minority that feels you know, quite under, under siege at the moment with Modi, is there a Muslim perspective on, on the American election? Yeah, thanks, Evan. Uh, great and tough questions, as always. I think my cast really comes in is, in some ways, vis-a-vis -vis the US elections, is in the Indian diaspora. Mm. And I think um, you know all the candidates that I put up there for you, and pretty much every candidate I could have put up for you, every Indian American CEO of a Silicon Valley company that I could have put up for you, is high cost, if not Brahmin. And I think um, it deserves to be noted that uh, that the kind of anti-caste bill in California uh, came out of a lot of reportage about uh, caste-based discrimination mm -hmm. within the kind of hallowed halls of Silicon Valley and Google and Apple. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I think, um, you know, it, it is 
the Hindu nationalist movement is not just a religious, it's not just a Hindu nationalist movement, it's, it's also a high caste movement. Um, it was a party that was traditionally um, an upper caste trader, um, petty shopkeeper party that was its support base. It has tried to diversify that a lot um, and has tried to reach out to lower caste groups. But I think the appeal of Hindu nationalism is an appeal of a kind of religious caste-based identity. I think it also explains why the Indian diaspora, while being democratic, though like Katrina, that's shifting, support the BJP back home. Mm. So I think it, it really allows us to kind of understand, uh, in a way, what might initially strike you as a bit of a paradox. Mm. Um, uh, but so I think that's where caste um, and, and religion, and you know, Christoph Jafferlo, who I think is a very sharp observer of, of Indian politics, has always said that caste and religion are this dialectic um, for Hindu nationalists. And just to say that I'm not sure that we have any, so, so you know, that kind of survey data is always harder to get for India. Mm. Um, and, and in particular to make it a kind of nationally representative sample. Um, and so I think that where I would necessarily see potential differences might be, again, on provincial lines. Um, gender, we haven't really spoken about gender, mm. but I think uh, the patriarchy of Trump was very appealing to Indian patriarchy. Um, and I think that I've spoken about kind of caste and religion, but patriarchy, that's the third component of Hindu nationalism. And of a lot of these exclusionary right-wing populist um, regimes across the world. And so I'd be interested actually to see more about what the kind of gender breakup of support uh, for these regimes in mm -hmm. India and in the US is. Great. Well, we'd love to turn to some questions from the audience. We have microphones on either side there. So I know that there are some of you with burning questions for one or more or all of our panelists. So if you wouldn't mind lining up um, behind those. Great, you can just stand right there. And, and, and if people line up and go you know, one after the other, but, but we'll start with you, sir. Yeah, my name is Leroy Stoddard. Uh, we all remember the excitement around the world uh, with the election of Barack Obama as president what it meant to people of color all around the world, and I think what it meant about American democracy. That was 16 years ago. Uh, does Kamala Harris's African descent carry any of the weight that Obama's did, and does her gender carry a different weight that might have appeal around the world that you're not seeing? Uh, we heard about the Tamil uh, connection, and that's real. But she is a woman of color, and she's a woman. So please comment on that. Prina, do, do you want to start, maybe? Um, yeah, those are great questions. Um, you know, so it's it's a bit of a again they're like you know as soon as you talk India you begin to use the word paradox contradictory uh, very often but even as I spoke about India as being and it truly is a deeply patriarchal country it's also a country that's had no problem electing female leaders from its very beginning so women were very prominent in India's nationalist struggle India had a female prime minister with no big deal at all in the 1970s um, it has had chief ministers including very very uh, powerful chief ministers of the state of Tamil Nadu who are women. Um, and so um, you know, there have been bills to uh, have uh, reserved seats for women in parliament. Seats are reserved for women for local um, elections. And so it's a, I, I think that Indians are always a little, Indians also love being self, like, you know, a little bit righteous. And so how dare America tell us? And that's where I think the democratic decline in America has been very dangerous in India, because they've lost any kind of moral high ground to be able to, to kind of, you know, because the Indian regime, the, the Hindu nationalist regime, at least in its first uh, iteration, came to power with a huge popular mandate. And so for a lot of people on the left uh, who did not support the regime, it seemed as if America would be the one that would kind of put pressure on India uh, to release some of the journalists, to not have this erosion of liberalism and the kind of um, attack on the free press. But America lost that, that legitimacy very quickly. And I think with the Kamala Harris being a woman, they're almost like, oh, how cute that they're still fighting this <laughs> battle uh, when we've had a female leader. That's of course, that doesn't absolve them from the, for the fact that India is also one of the most dangerous places to be a woman. Uh, you know, 
killed before you're born. Um, and so, so, you know, it's a, it's so I think her being a woman isn't really an issue, but it's, it's more that it, it's notable that it is an issue in, in, in the US. John, you know, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm a bit subjective. You know, Barack Obama has Kenyan roots, so <laughs> he, you know he was a rock star ac across <laughs> uh, across the African continent. You know, um, and you know uh, Kamala Harris, exciting, but d not on the same scale uh, at all. Um, she she hosted a democracy summit in Lusaka, Zambia last year. Uh, you know, it got a bit of reportage, but not not very much. So the excitement level isn't the same, which is also uh, a factor of the fact that American media in Africa has been in terminal decline for the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. So where, say, Time magazine had maybe 10 correspondents across Africa uh, by 1990, <coughs> maybe they have one on the African continent or two. Uh, Washington Post, New York Times, the same. So it's, it's also because people uh, are, are only capturing this information and news uh, from social media. It's not reported in the kind of structured way that uh, we saw with Barack Obama, where there were all these long stories and, and uh, colorful um, documentaries, etc., on, uh, on him when, when he came out. But as I said, I'm a Kenyan, so uh, very subjective. <laughs> You're asking the wrong person. OK. No, that's exactly the right person. But do you guys have any thoughts on Well, on well this? just that there, I think there, it's a little bit like the US. In your, I mean, in the sense that there's just a sense of relief that there's a possibility that Donald Trump won't be the president, whoever it is. And so I think, in a way, the, the experience of Trumpism has, has tainted, the, has poisoned the water in a way. I mean, I think there was a way in which Obama was regarded as the culmination of this evolution of American democracy, and so it had this incredible significance. Um, whereas this is sort of like, oh, you know, phew, we've made it past this. One, one other thing, though, I wanted to say, what I think that's interesting in thinking about the comparison to India is how you know, the degree to which Europeans feel, I mean, I've had so many people say to me, you know, we should have a right to vote in the American elections oh. because it affects us so much, <laughs> you know, and I've had many people say this to me. So there's a real sense of it that, you know, we, we almost need to have vote because this is going to affect our lives. And so it's really the opposite kind of dynamic with India where, and what's also interesting about this is, is given the Indian diaspora in the United States, there is more of a kind of connection of people, you know, in politics. You know, Europeans, you know, there's, of course, many European immigrants to the U.S. and recently European immigrants, but, th but that, that's not, it's not of the same scale. And so it's this kind of interesting thing where it's, I think, just really these security relations, these trade relations are the thing that are really panicking people. And they feel like, you know, if we, you know, we, too bad we can't vote, too. I mean, that's really the sense of that. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I would say for, for Latin America, they're somewhat similar to, to particularly India. On the one hand, also a very patriarchal society. I think of some of the support for Trump is driven by this, this, this sort of motivation. Um, but on the other hand, I think Obama's victory and, and arrival in the presidency, I happened to be in Cuba at the same time he was visiting in 2016. And the conversations that we were having with taxi drivers they were just so amazed mm. that a black man was actually elected mm. in the United, United States. States. I mean, it was really palpable. Um, I think for, for Kamala Harris, it's a little bit old news, because he was first. <laughs> I think her status as a woman, however, it's really resonating in Mexico. And Mexico just inaugurated its yeah. first female president mm. ever. Yeah. And so I have a lot of, and this is very anecdotal, but a lot of my friends in Mexico are really excited about the possibility that both countries will be led by women in a very historic way. So I think there is the gender component of her identity is resonating kind of powerfully, certainly in Mexico, if not beyond. Great. We have a question here. Hi, I'm Grace Cargill. I'm a reporter for the Huntington News at Northeastern. This question can kind of go for anybody. Um, some of you said that your regions didn't necessarily care that much in their media or that the US was no longer really like a democracy to watch for influence, but there definitely was a time and a point in history that the US democracy was the democracy to watch in terms of the powers and how they ran things. So just wondering for anybody up here on the panel, do you think that the US's democracy has lost its respect in the, glo in the global sphere? And do you think that it's too far gone in terms of like being ahead of the curve? Or do you think that there is a world where we can get back what we have lost? Anyone want to? I'll be democratic. I don't want to choose that one. <laughs> well, one thing I'll say, and as you know, I spend a lot of time talking 
to Europeans about all of the institutional flaws of American democracy and point, you know, and you know, so when I when I come in front of American audiences and say, you know, we need to have proportional representation, we should get rid of the electoral college, we should have term limits for judges, we should get rid of the filibuster, people go, you know, this is these are this is radical, this will never happen. You know, and then you go to Europe and people just yawn because it's like, of course you should get rid of that stuff. I mean, why do you have it? It's so commonsensical and everybody has it. So I think there's a sense in which, you know, if, if, there, if we could get through this trouble um, and we could carry out these kinds of reforms, I think there would be a room, there is room for kind of respect of, you know, the endurance and the resilience. And I guess one other thing is I think that, that one thing where people do re still respond positively, I think, to Amer about American democracy in Europe, Anyway, is the kind of sense that the U.S. is a multi-ethnic democracy and is more and, and deals with these issues in a much more sophisticated way than European democracies do. So I think there is a sense that the U.S. still kind of is a role model in that regard. So that's something you know, and we've seen all the backlash against that and so on. And so that takes away some of the luster. But I think you know, if we can get through these kinds of own, our own crises, there is the possibility that the U.S. could be a role model. And John, I don't know how you'd feel about this, but I mean, while I certainly agree that China has become such a looming alternative to the United States for people in Africa and people in, in other regions, for, for people who, who say, as many do in Africa, that democracy is still the best alternative, I don't know that there is any model of democracy that they look to more than the American case. Do you that, think that's fair? That's fair. I don't think there is. Um, I mean, there are frustrations with um, you know, American democracy and American foreign, foreign policy, as it is expressed in, quote unquote, the global south parts of Africa, is very different. Um, some of America's best friends in developing countries are not Democrats. Uh, there are people who are doing extremely bad things to, uh, to their citizens. And so that is the perspective that, you, that you've got to adopt. I mean, American democracy, the American model, was at its peak in 1990, fall of the Berlin Wall. Mm -hmm. um, in Africa, between 1989 and 1994, about 50 countries adopted multi-party politics, changed the constitutions, introduced term limits for heads of state. It was the most dramatic change. And, um, and the US, I mean, US aid offices across the continent were doing consultancy. It's, it's, it's an incredible time. So yes, I mean, the US has played that, uh, that role. I think what, what has been degraded somewhat by events within the US, but also uh, especially the, the actions of US friends and what they, are, they, 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 are, they seem to be allowed to do, is just the legitimacy of, of the model has been degraded. Um, but um, no, you, you won't bump into many people in African capitals who, you know, who, who are saying, OK, I, you know, I, I think we think the CCP is going to be the model for which we should govern ourselves for the next 50 years. I, we haven't reached that point yet. It's just that the, uh, this shining house on the hill is not as beautiful as it was 20 years ago. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. I have a question that relates to the sort of the re global regard of American democracy in the context of global leadership. So I think, you know, we as a as an American populace sort of presume American leadership on the global stage. Um, but I'm curious if the presidential election is perhaps inciting doubt into constituencies in, say, the global south especially, as to the merits of American leadership on the global states and perhaps move to a more multipolar world in which leaders such as, you know, from Singapore or small states that have had more consistent government governance over the past decades, even if they're not democracies, but have had relatively consistent uh, governance, whether they will be given opportunities to play larger leadership roles in the context of global affairs. Um, I, I just, I've, I've been involved in anti-corruption work for 30 years now. Uh, and I was, you know, with, working with Transparency International in Kenya from a very early stage. And we had a big reflection last year, 30 years after I got involved in this. And, you know, we've made tremendous strides. We still have a major corruption problem. Uh, around the world. Um, and it is the models uh, that we've had to reflect that actually some of the greatest successes in reversing major corruption problems. I mean, uh, a place like Singapore, 
uh, in countries in, a, in Africa, a country like Rwanda, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, unfortunately, some of the countries that have made some of the governance changes that seem to impact livelihoods of the poorest in society um, have a far more control-oriented model, for, for lack of a better way, way of putting it. And yes, people are beginning to say, OK, hold on, you know, uh, especially when you, you have societies where a lot of people have died violently. Mm -hmm. uh, a leader who, or leaders who can stop that are given a lot of leeway. And when they do a good job, yes, uh, they are studied. It's a controversial topic. Because when I got involved in anti-corruption work, it was the end of the Cold War, I, we were all very excited. I'm still at heart, total uh, Democrat. But I have to listen to those voices that are saying, hold on, you know, is this working for everyone in the same way? Thing is, it doesn't. Uh, so how do we fine tune it? Then we come to the US, oh, they are also fine tuning this giant that we have uh, been, been copying. But I, I think that um, uh, uh, there are lessons. We have, I think one of the things we have learned is that there are lessons to be learned from every society and from every experience. And those societies, those societies that were seen poorer, less democratic, or just very different, that had, were not seen as legitimate, uh, we have to accept in some areas they're very legitimate. Some of what they have been able to do in terms of education, health, for the poorest people in their societies cannot be ignored. Oh, thank you. Uh, my name is Tom Cadella. Um, the question I have is: is why um, is South America uh, just a totally forgotten area? <laughs> is siding with Harris? It just doesn't add up. They're used to, as you just described, the poor people that are inflicted in so many different ways. They look to strong people for change, and I've only heard from my you know, resources that Latin Americans are in favor of Trump for that reason. And they want the strong person, not so much because of Trump, but because that's what they've seen all their lives with the different presidents that have come in and so forth. And corruption is what kind of uh, attracts that. So when I saw your numbers there, I just, I was just, I had a hard time believing it. All right, let me, uh, a couple of things. One is, I, I think Latin Americans are a little bit more sophisticated. Um, uh, and, and it varies a lot from one country to another, what sort of political traditions they have, what sort of political traditions they have, how much of a kind of strongman phenomenon has been prevalent in, in different countries. Um, so that would be the first thing I would say. And the second thing I would say is I think the, the one, neglect, and two, toxic rhetoric about people from Latin America paints Trump in a very negative light. Also, the fact that he's willing to use trade and investment and aid to basically pursue a very one-issue agenda of controlling migration doesn't play well in, in the Americas, particularly since it's no longer just about Mexicans coming to the United States. I mean, the, the 8 million Venezuelans have left their country in the last 10 years, and they're spread around South America. Um, more of them are in South America than are, than are coming to the United States. And so I think they also feel that, that Trump is going to be a much less helpful partner in trying to figure out how to manage this, this displacement in, in South America than the, and then the Harris administration will be, you know, at least at the margins. Because um, Trump is essentially, his agenda is just relocate the problem south of the border. And, and we don't care how those countries deal with it. We don't, you know, it's, it's, so I think this sort of make America great, first of all, America is the Americas. <laughs> um, and then this kind of very inward focused um, orientation of the Trump administration in a region that is so incredibly interdependent with the United States, um, it doesn't play well for a lot of people in Latin America. There is, certainly there's support for Trump. Right? Um, and for example, Brazilians are also particularly inclined to support Trump. Brazilians in the United States, the Bolsonaro effect, I think, is real. It's strong. I suspect Salvadorans um, are quite you know, sort of inclined to lean toward Trump, in part because of their experience with, a, with a, an autocratic leader who has 
controlled crime very successfully. And they can sort of see the, the similarities between Trump and Bukele. So it's, it's quite nuanced and complex, I think. But those, I, those are some of the reasons that I would say suggest why Trump is less popular than Harris, or Biden-Harris in most of Latin America. Great. So I see two more uh, uh, people with questions. I'm going to ask to take both of those questions and then ask each of you to respond uh, to, to whichever of those questions you feel like you can and, and anything else you want to add in response uh, to what you heard from each other this evening. So let's hear those. Hello, this is Sebastian from Switzerland, uh, spending a sabbatical here uh, with my family in Harvard. And um, you, you described, thank you very much for all the insights, you described very much the US may less be the, the shining house of the hill, you know, less of a kind of the role model for democracy. So for you, representing educational, important educational institutions, can you already see an impact of that some people around the world, the smartest people around the world, have less of an interest mm. to come to the United States? Because that's seen from the outside. I think that's what the success of the country is built on a lot, right? So can you, can, is that already tangible for you that some people may say who would have previously, I'm going to go to, I can I go to MIT or Harvard, but they say, well, wait a second. I mean, maybe it's not that shining house of the hill. I consider alternative. So the impact on the educational system. It's kind of interesting that my question is linked to that issue about educational institutions. It seems to me that the, that the respect for American institutions, higher, higher education, is still very strong around the world. And the number of students, if you look at the Pew Research and the number of international students coming, it still remains pretty high, though there's some, some variation. The question I have is, uh, in this kind of debates about elections and democracy, uh, how does this kind of thing that we watched in American universities recently, these big demonstrations in, against the war, or even earlier during the Vietnam War, does it make the universities look more democratic or less democratic? Thank you for those questions. And so as I said, it'd be great um, as, we're, as we're almost out of time to hear, hear from each of you responding to those questions about educational institutions or um, any, any other reflections you might, might have had on the evening. Daniel, can we start with you? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so yeah, two very good questions have given me a lot to think about. Actually, before this presentation, one of the things I wanted to look, I was looking up was the number of, of Germans who spend uh, their time a year in high school in the United States. I couldn't find it, but my impression is at least among university-educated Germans, it's an incredibly high percentage of Germans have spent a year living with a family in some place like Oklahoma or Maine or Texas and have this deep connection. And that's partly why people feel like they should have a vote. I mean, so, you know, so I remember that when there was an attack, uh, when there was a Trump assault on the on this protesters at some point during the Trump presidency, I was being interviewed by a, a, a German journalist. And she was in tears saying, you know, if this you know, how is this happening? I and mean, really taking these things personally. So I think that the educational connections are not only at the university level, but the high school level are, are, have been an incredible success. Um, and so I think at the university level as well, I mean, they continue to be regarded as, as you know, the top universities in, in the world. And so I think that that's a great success. I, I guess on the second point, um, I mean, I could say a lot more, but I'll be just brief to allow my colleagues here to speak. The, the, the German setting is particularly interesting with regards to the student protests, because I think Germans are very conflicted and confused, I would even say, about how to interpret this. Because in the German setting, um, you know, the, the kind of commitment to Israel is essential, you know, is part of, you know, sort of post-war German identity. And so the kind of, you know, left-right issues and, you know, pro-Israel, you know, anti-Semitism become very complicated. And I think they have real difficulty even understanding the nature of the conflict here. Um, and so, you know, I think it's very much interpreted as, you know, any kind of criticism of Israel is interpreted as anti-Semitism in, in Germany, and much more often is the case. And so I think there's real fear of what's happened at a lot of American universities. Um, and I, you know, from my perspective, a bit of a misunderstanding of what's been happening on American campuses. But I, you know, I, one, one final thing I'll just say is that I think one of the, one of the things I most fear about a Trump presidency is the assault on American universities, or the you know, potential assault on American universities. And you know, as a kind of bulwark and a, of autonomy, of professionalism, of power, prestige, it's an alternative to a Trump presidency. And so you know, this is one of our institutions that continues to work well, and we need to do everything we can to defend them. 
Yeah, so um, I, I teach at the Fletcher School, which is a graduate school of, of, of international relations, and about 50% of our students are international. And we have definitely seen um, the effects of, I think, the Trump effect on international students and where they are choosing to go. I mean, a lot of it's financial, but it's also this, you know, the shabbier house on the hill, but also concerns about visa. Visas, yeah. right? And it, it had a huge. It's actually still we have students who can't get in, who who who, who were coming to, to the Fletcher School and still haven't arrived because of visa issues. Under the Trump administration, it got much more complicated. I think people are worried that that's going to happen again. So I think there's a real, actually, a real effect for for a school like mine. And then on the protests, I think in Latin America, my sense is there's a lot of solidarity, particularly mm -hmm. a young among young people mm -hmm. in Latin America. And in fact, that Pew poll suggested that one of the reasons there's less trust of Biden in Latin America is because they don't approve of how he's man handled the Gaza, um, the Gaza war. Um, and, I, and, and just in conversations, I think they sort of see themselves reflected in the protests in the US campuses very, very much. And there's really a sense of sort of solidarity with, with Palestine. It's quite strong in Latin America. John. No, just I mean I I think I agree with with the sentiment that's that's emerging in um, the sense one gets in Africa very strongly is that in terms of basic those basic freedoms, especially freedom for people to protest, to express themselves, etc. Um, really, yeah, there's a strong sense of solidarity um, amongst the young people uh, on issues are you know whether it's the war in Gaza, etc. Um, um, it's the sentiments are very much mirrored. And so one gets that uh, that sense that yeah, it's it's still very much appreciated to see that. Well, in, I mean, I I sense it when I was in New York last week. In one corner there was Falun Gong. Um, there was uh, people who were you know, supporting the the government in Israel. All in one corner. It's one of the things that makes America strong and makes people admire it. Yeah. Thanks for that, you know, one nice note of optimism <laughs> about America. Um, you know, and as, as a director of Center for International Studies, I'm so glad to have people like John Gatango come here. I don't think we had to rest you away from, you know, some other country to, to, to come. You were willing. Yeah, um, absolutely. But, but it's really, uh, it's, it, it's a pleasure for us to, to host people from around the world and to engage the perspectives of experts um, on international studies. The four of you did such a great job today. Um, I'm so grateful for your insights and grateful to all of you. There was a lot of great questions today. So thank you very much. And please join me in thanking our four speakers. Thank you. Thank you.